thanks, Rene, for that introduction. And it's indeed a pleasure, and a pleasure to be here, to be able to talk to you. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today is some of the work that we've been carrying out in our lab over the last few years, looking at the paradox of forest grassland mosaics, revisiting the one climate, one paradigm, uh, one biome paradigm. So if we open any basic ecology textbook, you're likely to see a picture that looks like this. This is Holdridge's life zone classification. Uh, and essentially what it says is if we know something about the climate of a place, so in this case, if you know something about the temperature, uh, the humidity, and the potential evapotranspiration, <coughs> then uh, we can, with a fair degree of accuracy, predict what the vegetation in that place should be. And here's another uh, such diagram. This is from Whitaker, 1975. And Whitaker uses just two climatic variables, which is precipitation and temperature. And the idea being that if you know precipitation and temperature, you should be able to predict the biome that is likely to occur uh, under these climatic conditions. In other words, one climate, one biome. And th these ideas have, uh, have been sort of intrinsically intertwined into the concept of a climax uh, community or a climax vegetation that has pervaded ecological thinking for a long time now. And even though the, it has fallen out of vogue in recent years, particularly among scientists, uh, land managers continue to use the climax concept, right? And more often than not, uh, the, the concept of a climax community is often treated synonymously with forest. And that can be a problem when it comes to managing land, as I will talk about, uh, you know, for the rest of this talk. Now, for the most part, uh, these climate, the one climate, one biome hypothesis holds true. And, you know, with a fair degree of accuracy, we can predict what vegetation we are expected to see in a place given the climate. However, there are certain cases when this uh, paradigm, the one climate, one biome paradigm, does not hold true. And in these cases, uh, you know, clinging on to the climax uh, concept can lead to serious mismanagement of biomes. And I'm going to talk about one such case study, uh, which is the Nilgiri uh, Biosphere Reserve and the Shola grassland mosaics of the upper elevations of the Nilgiri. Right, so in the high elevations of the Western Ghats, uh, we have these montane forest grassland mosaics, uh, also called Shola grassland mosaics, where under the same climate, we essentially see two different vegetation types. So we can see forests. Uh, these are stunted evergreen forests that are embedded in a largely grassland matrix, right? So one climate, multiple biomes. And this phenomenon is not uh, restricted just to the Western Ghats, but it's fairly widespread globally. So here are examples from different parts of the world, from Malawi, from Sri Lanka, from Bolivia, from Madagascar, and so on. So right across the globe, we see many instances of where we're having multiple biomes occurring under the same climate. So what is it that actually maintains these biomes? So traditionally, uh, when ecologists and land managers looked at these biomes, uh, what they, the first impression was that these are anthropogenic artifacts. In other words, these used to be covered by forests, but sometime in the past, humans came, they clear cut the vegetation, and what we see now is the artifact of past or the legacy of past human activities. But is that really the case? So a lot of uh, ecologists have gone and tried to recreate the paleo history of these biomes uh, using soil cores and using proxies such as pollen, isotopic ratios, and so on. And I'm, I won't go into the details of how this is actually done, but because C3, uh, the grasses, uh, employ the C4 part, uh, photosynthetic pathway, and the trees employ the C3 photosynthetic pathway, and both of these have different isotopic signatures, we can actually get an idea of the relative abundance of grasses uh, versus trees by looking at sediment cores. And uh, I'm just going to talk about one example. This was done, work done by Professor Sukumar's group at CES, where they dated, uh, used soil cores to date, uh, you know, to look at the ecological history of the upper Nilgiris. And this is shown in the graph on the right. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the proportion of C4 plants, and they were able to date the core up to 40,000 years before present. And what I want you to take from here is that both grasses and trees have been present in the system for more than for almost 40,000 years, uh, for 40,000 years or more. And also, and although their relative abundance has changed over time, 
uh, both grasses and uh, forests have been present for a very long time. Uh, he, he, yeah, so forest grassland mosaic in the Nilgiri persisted for at least the last 40,000 years. And another study uh, that has that is yet to be published by the same group, but it's up in bioarchive, dates human presence in these ecosystems to uh, to 3,500 years ago. Right, and there have been studies conducted all over the globe, particularly in forest grassland mosaics, and they all say the same story. So multiple lines of evidence uh, suggest that forest grassland mosaics in many parts of the world are ancient. In many cases, they predate human settlement, and they are, thus they do not appear to be anthropogenic artifacts, but rather natural systems. Right, so then the question becomes, what maintains these forest grassland mosaics, and how did they come about? I'm not going to answer the second question because we really don't know the answer to it, but we're going to focus on the first question. In other words, what is it that actually maintains these forest grassland mosaics? And this has been debated at least in the Indian context since the 1930s. So people first proposed the role of microclimate, particularly frosts, in maintaining these mosaics. Uh, after a while, people argued that no, it was soil, it was adaptive factors that actually uh, maintain these mosaics followed by fire, and then uh, also herbivory. And, uh, you know, these are some of the conclusions that earlier researchers have come to uh, based on largely correlated studies. First, hence frost occurrence probably does not provide a satisfactory explanation for the restriction of sholas to the depressions and grasslands to the exposed surfaces uh, from 1994. The assumption that grasslands are steady state uh, maintained by edaphic factors holds good. So they said it's actually the soils. Uh, uh, with no conclusive evidence of the frost hypothesis, the fire hypothesis has gained favor. And then the next comment, uh, again, is that fire is an important role in maintaining these grasslands. But the problem is all of these studies drew these conclusions based on correlative evidence. And there was actually up to now, there hasn't been a single test of these different mechanisms. And so that is what we set out to do, to actually test which one of these mechanisms uh, holds true. And I'm going to largely draw on the work of one of my uh, ex-PhD students, Dr. Atul Joshi, uh, for the rest of this talk. So we, we carried out our work in the shoulder grasslands of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, as is shown on the map. And the first thing Atul did was he tried to recreate the history of, uh, of the Nilgiris. And so he went to the British, uh, the India office of the British Library, and sort of went through old uh, correspondence from foresters and old documents from the colonial era. So it turns out, so this is a painting from 1857 of what Uti looked like. And as you can see, it is actually a forest grassland mosaic. The lake that you see there is Uti Lake. Here's another uh, drawing from, again, from the 1857s of St. Stephen's uh, Cathedral in Uti. And, uh, you know, when the colonial foresters came here for the first time and they viewed this landscape, uh, because they had this whole climax concept in mind, they sort of assumed that, you know, the indigenous communities here had seriously mismanaged the land and what was originally forests had been converted uh, because of bad management practices and grazing to these grasslands, right? And so they started planting trees. And by the 1950s, this is that same location of St. Saint, uh, Saint Stephen's Cathedral, and this is what it looks like. And over the years, they planted over 100 different species of trees. Uh, many of them didn't take, but a few of them became invasive, and they spread through the landscape. And one major invasive is Acacia mernsii, or black wattles. So if you can see here, the, the bright green patch is actually a native forest, and all the rest around is grassland that has been invaded by this exotic tree, Acacia mundia. Unfortunately, uh, the forest department, uh, there are still uh, practices where they, uh, so this is a photograph from a few years ago of a tree planting initiative in the grasslands. Uh, luckily, for this one didn't take. Uh, yeah, so that's just a brief history of the place. And so the question is, what limits tree establishment in grasslands? So we can think of this as a demographic cycle so we have seeds, uh, needs to transition to seedlings, they need to establish and become saplings and to adults and back. So the first question we ask would do soils and microclimate influence the seedling generation? So this is a factorial experiment where we had two species, uh, and the invasive species. Uh, we had 14 replicate sites. 
So we had two different uh, soil treatments. We took soil from the grasslands, we took soil from the shola to see if there were differences between the two, and we germinated seeds in these different trays, and we placed these trays in either the grassland patch, so grassland mi microclimate, or within the forest patch, which is the for uh, forest microclimate. So two different soil types, two different microclimate types. Yeah, so what are the results? So on the left is germination in the shola, uh, which is inside the forest, and on the right is inside the grassland. So there are three points that we can take here. First is there's no effect of soil type on germination success. So if you compare grassland soil versus shola soils, uh, in either the left graph or the right graph, we're seeing no difference. The second point is there tends to be greater germination in the grasslands, which is counter to what we expected. We expected less germination in the grasslands, but in fact we see more germination in the grasslands for both the native and the invasive species. And the third point to take home here is that the germination success of the invasive is three times greater than the native species. Yeah, so coming to this question, do soils and microclimates influence germination? Soil, the answer is no, and microclimate, in fact, it's just the opposite, where grasslands seem to be more favorable for the germination of the trees. So clearly, the demographic bottleneck does not seem to be occurring at this stage, and so then we carried on to ask the next question, what happens between the seedling and the sapling transition? So we continued this, uh, of all the seedlings that, we, that survived, we sort of transferred them into these larger bags, and we placed them uh, next in both the forests and the grasslands, and we, we followed them over time. So these graphs show the survival of uh, the native and the invasive species in the grassland sites and in the shola sites. So the graph on the left is for the grassland sites. The red line is the invasive species, and you can see the invasive species survives quite well. About 70 to 80 percent of the seedlings are able to survive the winter and into next summer. But if you look at the native species in the grassland, we see a precipitous decline with this huge overwinter mortality, and most of them are dead by spring. Whereas on the right, if we look inside the forest, uh, forest patches, both the native and the invasive species are able to survive quite well, with the native species, in fact, doing better than the invasive species. So there's drastic over, overwinter mortality uh, of the native seedlings in the grassland. And the obvious driver here is temperature. And so we, we also measure temperature across this gradient. So this graph shows how temperatures change from five meters inside the forest uh, across the boundary and into five meters into the grassland. And these are the minimum temperatures. And over this 10 meter gradient, we see almost a seven to 10 degree difference in temperature. Where inside the forest, temperatures rarely go below zero, whereas in the grasslands, temperature consistently falls below zero or freezing in the winter. So, so we said, okay, this suggests that temperature is the driver, so let's see if we can actually manipulate temperatures and see what happens to success of these species, right? Uh, so just to synthesize, next. So soils and microclimate influence seedling establishments. The answer for soils, again, is no. And the conclusion is that native species are unable to survive the winter in the grasslands, but they can do so within the forest but the alien species is able to do so. So we conducted a warming experiment where we collected seeds, germinated them, transported the field, and then put them back, uh, as we took them back to the field. And we had a warming experiment. We had five native species, one invasive species, and essentially we had two treatments. So we planted all of these seedlings in these bags back at the field. And if you look on the right, half of this, uh, you see these little structures. So we created these little structures that had thermal blankets over them, and we would place them on these seedlings every night, uh, and these thermal blankets trap the heat, and then we'd take them out every, every morning. So it was a nighttime warming experiment, and this is the effectiveness of our treatments. So the red lines show the nighttime warming treatments. In all cases, temperatures were uh, much greater than the controls, and in contrast to the controls where 15 nights, uh, the temperatures went below zero, it only happened twice in our warming treatments, one one time when we couldn't actually place the, uh, uh, the, the thermal blankets, and then another time when it blew off. That's what frost looks like. So what do these results look like? On the left, it's the control treatment. As you can see, this is overwinter success. The blue line, which is the native species, uh, most of them died by the end of winter, whereas survival was much higher in the invasive species. Whereas if you look at the graph on the right, which is nighttime warming, we see that survival of native species is almost 40% higher. And survival of invasive species is really high. Almost 90% of them survived 
uh, when they were warmed. And the steep decline in the native, uh, in the native species was following one of the frost events, right? So if that frost event hadn't occurred, uh, it was likely that survival of the natives would be much higher. Next. So significantly greater, yeah. So what do these results suggest? They suggest that no, low nighttime winter temperatures with particularly frost imposes a strong demographic bottleneck for native species. Future warming is likely to favor tree establishment in the grasslands and lead to forest expansion. And importantly, the invasives are going to be facilitated more. So it's going to lead to a greater problem in the future under warmer temperatures when the invasion problem is going to be even greater. So what, do we all, what does all this mean? So what we see is uh, we have a forest patch and we have grasslands, and there's some factors imposing a demographic bottleneck on seedling establishment here. We looked at the effect of fire, but it's likely that in other grassland, shoulder grassland mosaics, which are at lower elevation, it may be other drivers such as fire. Once trees is established, there's a feedback loop that actually serves to attenuate this demographic bottleneck. And so trees are able to establish within these patches, but not outside. A couple of other drivers, soil. Soil is not very exciting because uh, if there are differences in soil, then, uh, you know, obviously we'll see differences in vegetation. But herbivory is another driver that people have argued. Uh, we don't think it's a big driver in our system, but we're studying other mosaics where uh, it may be an important driver. So the idea being anything that creates a demographic bottleneck in the grassland, but where tree presence attenuates that bottleneck can cause uh, the maintenance of these mosaics. But as to how these came about in the first place, uh, we really don't have the answer. We're hoping to sort of look at it over the next, uh, you know, in the coming years. And with that, I would just like to thank uh, all of the people who helped with this and also uh, funding from various sources. And with that, I'll stop. 